Well, hello to all of you from around the world. I want to thank you for joining us for another edition of Soul Liberty Today, broadcasting live from our studio right here in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., and on KMET 1490 AM radio in Southern California. My name is Brian Wesley Johnson, and whether you're at home, driving, or even at work, we are always glad you're here with us. You know, we have a very special show for you today. We're going to be talking about something that I think is important to all of us, but, but specifically women. But first, I need to welcome my amazing co-host for today, Dr. Chanel de Guzman, executive leadership coach, author, and Solivia's senior contributor. Hey, Chanel, so glad you're here with me today. Good morning, Brian. How are you doing? I am fantastic. It is a beautiful Thursday here in the nation's capital. Couldn't be happier. It's a little humid, but you know, I'll take it. I'll take it. How about you? How have you been? Oh, I've been awesome. Awesome. Just, you know, busy as ever. Um, we're just getting over some last couple of days of rain. And so it's gray and, um, you know, the weather is probably around, we'll get up to about 60, 65. So we're mm -hmm. still, you know, haven't broke through yet, but um, all is well. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, these are the times at which it's a little bit of a weather roller coaster ride, right? Where it look a little cool, a little warm, a little rainy, a little sunny. Um, at, you know, we've been talking offline. Uh, my honey's allergies have been just like kicking her behind, yeah. and so uh, she's yeah. a little bit. She's been better the last day or so, um, but um, it's been a little crazy up to say the least. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> some people have had that um um I don't know the upper respiratory infections and things like that going on all at the same time. So some people haven't been doing so hot, but um you know, thank God for health and and uh well-being. So absolutely, absolutely. Um really important thing we're going to be talking about today. I mean, I'll introduce it in just a second, but um, you know, kind of crazy, kind of crazy. Uh, so we're going to dive into all this, but let's start here. The last few weeks in women's collegiate sports have been thrilling. This is specifically true for the NCAA basketball tournament. You know, all these teams battled with heart, passion, and determination, but in the end, there was one team that was above the rest. This year, that team was South Carolina. And while we take time to congratulate this awesome team, there was also something else that was equally awesome. The final game between South Carolina's Gamecocks and the University of Iowa's Hawkeyes averaged about 18.7 million viewers and peaked at a whopping 24 million combined on ESPN and ABC, making it the first time in history that a women's final had drawn a larger TV audience than the men's. Now, this was according to ESPN. So there's a lot to celebrate about women's sport, right? Well, the answer is a qualified yes. Why is it qualified? Well, listen to this story from ABC News. Caitlin Clark was officially drafted by the Indiana Fever as the number one pick in the WNBA. This comes on the heels of a game-changing March Madness that had everyone buzzing about the WNBA draft. Well, it happened. ABC's Lara Spencer has all the big moments from last night. With the first pick in the 2024 WNBA draft, the Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark, University of Iowa. Excitement hitting a fever pitch as basketball superstar Caitlin Clark officially launches her WNBA career. I've dreamed of this moment since I was in second grade, and it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of ups and downs, but uh, more than anything, just trying to soak it in. The NCAA leading scorer and overall number one draft pick chosen by the Indiana Fever, basking in the moment with her family. I told my mom before this, is like, you know, I earned it, and that's why I'm so proud of it. 
Thousands of fans from her new team erupting in celebration. Her new teammates ready with Clark's jersey in hand. Clark, one of several superstars taking their talents to the WNBA this year. Cameron Brink, Stanford University. After an electric season, number two overall pick Cameron Brink heading to the Los Angeles Sparks. Her godparents are the parents of NBA superstar Steph Curry. The two have known each other since they were kids. So I actually FaceTimed Steph like five minutes before the, the show started. So he just said to, to just have fun with it. I think he can just share so much great advice. And Chi Town doubling up on star power. Camilla Cardosa. Angel Reese, LSU. Third pick, Camila Cardozo, and seventh pick, Angel Reese, former SEC rivals, now teammates for the Chicago Sky. I had a go to be here tonight and give my family a better life. So I'm just so thankful that I was able to be here. <laughs> I'm just so excited. I get to play with Camilla. And for the first time in more than 25 years, Two Hawkeyes drafted in the same year. Clark's Iowa teammate Kate Martin, a surprise pick in the second round, heading to the Las Vegas Aces. I was here to support Caitlin. All I wanted was an opportunity, and I got it, so I'm really excited. All right, thanks to Lara Spencer for that report. ABC News contributor and USA Today columnist Christine Brennan is joining me now for more on this. Gosh, what a night. How exciting. What an exciting moment for all, moment for all those women. Uh, Caitlin Clark, we got to start with her. No question goes uh, number one last night. Uh, but for her rookie season, she's only making $76,000. I say only, but that's just in comparison to other NBA players and WNBA players. What does that say about the pay gap in women's sports. Stephanie, it says that the nation is now going to wake up to uh, the inequality in terms of pay, and it will change. Uh, the media rights deal for the WNBA is up. There will be negotiations, and Caitlin Clark will change that as well. But really, this is all about capitalism. I mean, for a generation, people have ignored the WNBA. They haven't bought tickets. They haven't watched. They haven't bought uh, the products they're seeing on the commercials. And Everything changes. I think the eyeballs on this number, $76,000. Now, again, she's making much more than that. Her endorsements are into the millions. There's also a chance of having $250,000 contract or addition for um, marketing the WNBA. I'm sure she'll get that as well. So she's she's a, she's a going to be a multimillionaire. But it's shining a light on something that we should be looking at. Title IX is, of course, applying to high schools and colleges. This is about capitalism. This is about Americans spending their money in a certain way. And that's going to change because of the eyeballs, because of the TV ratings. Caitlin Clark will be, the Caitlin Clark effect, Stephanie, will be impacting that as well. And it's about time because these women obviously have been underpaid now for several decades. It is about time and the game is certainly changing. Thank you so much for your time. ABC News contributor and USA Today columnist, Christine Brennan. Thank you. Looking forward to the. Dr. Chanel, Dr. Chanel. So the talk of the sports world right now, and it continues, it's continuing today, has been that number, $76,000. Am I right? Um, because we kind of talked about this earlier. What are your thoughts when you hear that report? So there's a lot behind that number. And there's a lot in addition to that number, but on face value, that is what everybody is clued into, $76,000 a year. That's, that's even less than you know a typical grad of a four-year college degree might make. Um, but again, that's just on face value, as you and I know. We know that you know, she's going to get more endorsements. She's going to get marketing dollars, as was said in the in the piece from the WNBA, and um, there will be more to come. She will become a multimillionaire, um, probably within the first year outside of the seventy-six thousand dollars salary. But we do need to talk about what, you know, why there is such the inequity inequity between the NBA and the WNBA, and right. really that's that's what the the true you know, rub is, you know, um, but, but at the same time, let's celebrate the fact 
and I'm excited, you know, you're excited to see, you know, she had this dream since she was in the second, Caitlin Clark, since she was in the second yeah. grade and to right. pursue it. And she said, she, she wanted this and she felt like she earned this. Right. So that's something to be celebrated. And the other draft picks as well. It's exciting. Right. It's exciting. And it's also exciting, like you said, for all of the, the uh, exposure from the actual final four or the final you know, championship game um, and those ratings and those historical numbers. So there is a lot to celebrate as well. Right, right, right. And, 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 and just to be clear, I mean, there's, there's, and I agree with you, there's a couple of different angles to come at, come at this. Um, one is just, my gosh, I mean, $76,000 for a single person is like, middle class. I mean, that's like solid middle class, you know, that's not upper middle class. And so what happens around the players that aren't stars, right? That are, that are bit that are like that, you know, six, six seat and below, right? I mean, like that second team or even third teams, how much are they going to make per year? Right? Are they even going to be in mi middle class? Right? Um, cause those players may or may not get, they probably won't get the same amount of endorsements and, and promotions and, no. and all that kind oh, of money. That probably not. The, right. And so th these questions kind of come up now. Yes, there is a huge, this is about capitalism and there's a huge difference between the amount of revenue that the NBA pulls in as opposed to the WB, WNBA. I mean, the, um, the NBA pulls in $10 billion per year, 10 billion, that's with a B. The WBA pulls in $200 million per year. However, given the fact that we had this great news around the championship this year, where more people watched the women's championship than the men's championship, says something around how people are feeling about women's sport right now. So my hope is you have these four top players that are all going to become multimillionaires. They're all going to be seen everywhere. They're all going to be part of the WNBA that that revenue will go up and we'll keep an eye to see whether or not the, the number goes up on, uh, you know, on terms of women's starting salaries and the salaries at all, of all players, right? Because I know in the NFL, they have a cap, they have a, a baseline, which is way in the, three. it's in the, it's like 300, $400 million per year for even the bench warmer who's sitting mm -hmm. on the bench, you know? And then if right. they're there for three or four years, they get lifetime, they get, they have lifetime of benefits, including salary. So, mm -hmm. There's a big difference here. So listen, we're going to keep talking about this. We've got more on this coming up. Um, so stay right there, everybody. And we're going to be take this little break and we'll be back with more of Solivity today in just a second. Do you see me kneeling on this dual roller called Parasetter? It's actually comfortable because of this channel and the softness of the special foam. It feels like my kneecaps are being massaged. When I lie down, my spine is housed in this channel while the convex rollers massage my muscles. They let go and lengthen. There's a traction effect from my head on the headrest and my mid back from the rib wrap, which hugs me. When I start the breathing sequence, I feel calm because my cortisol levels are dropping. Lower cortisol means bye-bye constant hunger. Parasetter is 40 inches long and much more comfortable than old-style rollers, but it weighs only 10 ounces. Parasetter, just like Pilates was, is no longer an insider secret. Do yourself a favor. Reset your parasympathetic nervous system. Defeat stress. Lying, sitting, kneeling, or standing this unique patented roller helps everyone.
Join us every weekday at 8 a.m. for Soul Liberty Today. Whether you're just starting your day or on the road, Soul Liberty Today will make your days better. We will empower you with authentic conversation about the latest news and trending topics. Plus, you won't want to miss our interviews with industry experts. So sit back, relax, and get ready for a whole lot of fun. Soul Liberty Today, weekdays at 8 a.m. only on KMET 1490 AM radio and ABC News affiliate. Hey, we are back here with more on Solivity today. Um, back with us again is Dr. Chanel de Guzman, author and executive leadership coach. We are putting a spotlight on women's pay and equity in sports and the marketplace more broadly. Um, why don't you guys to check out this one clip? Shanae Gumuke, Suns power forward, WNBA All-Star, Stanford grad, and vice president of the WNBA Players Association. Now that's important. Now. All right, let's jump right in on what I mentioned her, Liz Cambage, who plays for the Wings, said last night after the game. All right, I think we have those quotes here because she said that her WNBA career going forward, she doesn't know if she's going to come back. She said, I've said this many times, the WNBA doesn't pay my bills. Playing here doesn't pay my bills. We make more money overseas. I'm ready to have next summer off and focus on getting a European contract where it's 10 seasons here worth the pay. All right, now you are the VP of the WNBA Players Association, and you guys have until October 31st to opt out of the CBA that you agreed upon with the league. Like, you hear what Liz is saying about pay. What are the players talking about as it comes to this October 31st deadline? About 10 hours ago, I was actually having dinner post-game with perfect, Liz, and she was sort of alluding to some of these ideas. But people don't realize she's obviously an Australian national, so the WNBA is not necessarily her home like it is for us. But I think the idea is that the WNBA is the best women's basketball league in the world. Everyone wants to compare it to the NBA, but it's a league that stands on its own. But we're not compensated like the best women's basketball league in the world. There's China. There's Russia. My sister played in Poland. I played in Italy. And those leagues, as she mentioned, could play two times, three times, four times, five, up to ten times your WNBA salary. So what's the incentive for Liz to stay? I mean, she's just thinking about playing full term year round. Yeah. And if she gets injured in the WNBA, it could affect her overseas money. So it's unfortunate that the best league isn't compensated like it. And that's why you have issues like this. And what are you what are the players actually thinking ahead of that deadline? Is that a deadline that we should be paying attention to because it's a possibility that players can opt out? Absolutely. Opt out? Absolutely. Yep. Actually, at WNBA All-Star, Diana Taurasi, Candace Parker were very adamant about pushing the boundaries with this next CBA. For so long, WNBA players have been grateful and told to be grateful. And we are. We're caretakers of a legacy. The league is 22 years old, and it's the only women's professional sports league that has never folded. And we're very grateful. But let me be real, okay? Time is money. Yeah. Time is money. And when we are here in the U.S., most people don't understand that we actually are seven months overseas. When we're here in the U.S., our time is money because we're not home. And also, you know, we're giving our hearts, our minds, our souls, our bodies. I've had two injuries um, to this league, and we feel like we need to be compensated likewise. So there are three areas that we are really trying to attack. That's player salaries. That's also player experience and health and safety. All right, so you say Tarazi saying push the boundaries, right? And you mentioned those three pillars, but does that mean looking at, you know, commercial flying? We obviously saw the huge issue with the canceled game. What are some of the specifically things, like when you talk about more money, how much money are we talking about? Like, what, what can you share with us about what types of things you guys want? See, that's the thing. There's a lot of ambiguity. We don't really know the financials of the WNBA, except be happy if the economics were better, we could pay you more. Right. But we believe the ratings are up. They say ticket sales are up. And we also realize that if you want to grow our game, you have to actually invest in the players who are the game. If you invest in the players, those players will maybe not go overseas. They maybe will attract more ticket sales, more sponsorships. Now, I find it strange that the NBA has sponsors, the WNBA has sponsors, and our sponsors are exactly the same as the NBA. Kind of strange. We're a whole different league. We're women that hoop. We should attract female sponsors, you know, youth community empowerment okay. sponsors. So there are a lot of different models that we are brainstorming, hopefully, to grow our game. Shanae, thank you for your time. Keep Love killing me. it on the court. I'll try my best. Appreciate it. Nice highlight, though. <laughs> thank you. I did my best. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> love it. Love it. Now, that clip you just listened to, everyone, is not from this week. It was from 2018. Yes, six years ago. Uh, so for those of you who are thinking before we played this clip, why aren't women speaking up about this and blah, 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 doing that mansplaining thing, just just, shut, just go, close the mouth, close the mouth, because <laughs> they have been talking about it. Um, uh, and this player uh, has brought up some very important points. I mean, six years ago, um, like you may ask um, uh, the one player that, that got detained in Russia for that long time. Like, why was she in Russia and all this kind of stuff? Because she could not make the kind of money she needed to make for her family by only playing for the WNBA. And, and she is not alone. There are a lot of players that go overseas and play in the European League, which means that they have to go to places like Russia and other places to play. And so, um, you know, Again, you know, Chanel, why, sh you know, I know why I am interested in this. Why are you interested in this? Other, I mean, yes, you're a woman and you're a business person and that kind of thing. Why is this so important for you in the position that you hold today? Yeah, I appreciate that question, Brian. It yeah. basically shows our bias as a society that our society prefers men over women. That's mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. crux of it all. Even though I am a strong proponent of women, women's aspirations, women's goals and dreams, we still are not as preferred as men. And so you see it played out in instances like this. Um, you know, we have a historical legacy of gender inequality and yeah. as it relates to gender inequity in our pay. So mm -hmm. in every industry, in every occupation, women earn less than men. Yeah. And so honestly, should we say, why is that any different? Should that be different in the WNBA if it's across the board, right? And yeah. again, it's because there's a preference for men. There is more attention to men. There's clearly, like she said, there the sponsorship hasn't come forth from women, from right. community organizations to support the WNBA. Even right. though she said that the sponsorship is the same, you know, we need to expand that, right? So right. women owners need to put forth money. As she said, they need to make an investment. There needs to be an entire investment in the women athletes, right? Because right. it's just not there. And so, yeah, they are trying to survive and pay their bills. Like was said, I think by Liz, that she has to pay her bills. And so going overseas, going into quote unquote foreign countries, you know, like China, Russia, Italy, that's what they have to do to, to make the money, to supplement the, the income, right? Yeah. Of the disparities that they're making right. here at home. And you know the saying, um, people are more valued sometimes away from their home than they are at home. Right. I don't know the right. exact quote from the Bible, but you know what I mean, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. And, and as we're going to break here, um, just for those of you who may be interested in, you know, well, this is, we're, we're talking about starting salaries. So is it different as players move on and become regular players yeah but a little bit different um in 20 in 2023 wnba players uh make an average of hundred and thirteen thousand dollars per year uh with the highest salary in the league being a little over two hundred and forty one thousand. that's compared to the average in the nba being 9.7 million dollars so there's a huge, huge difference. It's 85 times more. 85 Yeah, times and you more. know, Brian, just absolutely. I mean, you just look at the vastness of, of those numbers and that, that disparity. And I, I guess one of the things that I don't hear yet is male owners, and I just haven't heard it, but male yeah. owners, we need allies, right? In any movement we need allies from the other side right. to step in and say 
yes, women deserve to make as much as the male players. Um, We need to make the investment. We need to provide the sponsorship. So I don't hear any males, um, any male owners coming forth to put this in the spotlight. And maybe because again, this is just not my basketball, you know, the WNBA is not necessarily my expertise, but I don't, I haven't seen any, any uh, allies come forth. Have you? No. And to that, to that, to that, also, where are the where are the male players? Right, male right. players need to be talking about this too. I mean, um, in tennis, men came out and said that the fact that you had like uh, Serena Williams and Venus Williams and 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 other players of that caliber were paid a lot less in prize money for championships Mm -hmm. and that kind of thing than men were. And men came out and said, this is not right. This is not right. And so they Mm -hmm. equalized it, right? Um, There's still some disparities around like promote, you know, promotional money and stuff like that. And there, and that's happening. But the fact that it moved that forward changed the game. And so men, you got to come out and talk about this too. I mean, this is, you know, I've been to w, you know, WNBA games. They are exciting. It is fun. Uh, you know, these women are out there balling. And so it's not like, oh, well, it's not as exciting as an NBA. No, 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 no. Well, it's the numbers prove all. it in the championship game. So. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, it, so, so everybody has to be on target around this and speak up. Um, yeah. You know. We're going to take a quick break, um, but when we come back, want to introduce another very deliberative body around, you know, e- you know, equity and equality and diversity and inclusion, and that's the United Nations and the United uh, Nations Women's Section of that organization has a lot to say about this. So when we come back, we're going to have them take the floor a little bit and talk about this. So we'll be right back in two minutes. Hi there, this is Brian with Solivity.com. I wanna share some exciting news about our new Aspire Academy by Solivity. Now, you probably want to know what the Aspire Academy by Solivity is. Well, it exclusively connects you with people around the globe and who share the intense desire to improve themselves and create a better life for themselves today. There's classes, there's workshops, there's live events, and even more exclusively just for you. You see, I wanted you to have a safe space where you could grow, you can learn, and it would empower you in all aspects of your life, including your mind, your body, and your soul. So how do you get started? Well, it is so easy. First of all, the best part, joining Aspire Academy is absolutely free. Just click on the Join Now button, sign up, and begin your journey as a special part of this invitation to you. There are some free courses that are available for you to try from our amazing roster of coaches and collaborators. It's our way of saying thank you for all of your support and being with us along our journey of expansion. I hope you enjoy the Aspire Academy by Solivity today. Start the process, learn more about your passion, your purpose, and how to live a higher quality life. You can learn more about the Aspire Academy by visiting aspire.solivity.com today. Hey, we're back here with more on Solivity today. And back with us is Dr. Chanel de Guzman, author, executive leadership coach. Uh, we're bringing a spotlight on women's pay inequity in sports and the marketplace more broadly. Um, you know, Chanel, I found this fantastic policy brief 
that was created by the UN Women's uh, UN Women in 2016, and, and they have this beautiful summary that's there um, that shed some light on on why it was important to them and why it should be important to all of us. And you can learn more about UN Women by visiting their site at unwomen.org uh, forward slash English if you're in English. But um, the the quote goes like this. Um, 60, 65 years after the International Labor Organization Convention number 100 on equal re, remuneration, the gender pay gap remains pervasive across all regions and most sectors, and policy debate continues on how to close it. Policy attention has focused on women's own behavior and choices, <laughs> but women have been investing more in their education and participating more consciously in employment without reaping the expected benefits. It is time to focus instead on changing the environment in which women are making choices. I know I can hear, I can see that invisible hand going up like waving the white handkerchief, Chanel, like amen, amen, amen. We have to change the environment. Women are going to keep making, making choices, right? But the environment is not, is not conducive to rewarding women equally and equitably for those choices, right? So right. important. So important. Your thoughts? Yeah. So, you know, it just, well, one thing I heard, yeah, is not blaming, but shining a light on women's choices but like yeah. you said there are constraints within those choices if i go into being a teacher you know i'm going to make this amount if i go into a stem field i might make a little bit more but across the board again we're we don't have the pay structure that is still making the pay equitable to men's and so what is the incentive then if we don't figure out some structural um, resolutions to these barriers that prevent and keep keep the inequity alive. You know, so right. we know it's systemic. We know it's embedded in our systems. We know it's embedded in our policies and our compensation um, structures and organizations and entities like the WNBA. Um, and so we've got to start, you know, dismantling it with uh -huh. leadership programs, with awareness, with education, like talking about it, how we are doing now, always trying to aware, increase awareness um, and things that, like I said, pulling in other people who can have more, who might have existing power right now from a capitalistic uh -huh. uh, vantage point to step in and make investments to expand the environment, to create equity within our environments so that everybody will get paid their worth. Right, 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 right. Um, you know, um, I highly recommend that people go in and download um, the information from you and women. I mean, this, is, this was, again, a law, longitudinal study around all this um, and that um, the gap hasn't really closed all that much. There, there are certain countries that where the gap is 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 very small, but those countries have have really made concerted effort to make it that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, in other countries around, I mean, like in Europe, for example, not saying that they're better or whatever, but in Europe, for example, why you see more women in leadership because they have made a concerted effort to make sure that women are, are treated fairly and equitably, equitably and equally, and that women need to be in leadership positions. They've just made the decision to do that. Um, they have three areas of recommendation around basic, more importantly, reforming employment institutions. 
right? Because this is these are the places that pay all of us, right? Um, they said to promote equal pay, reforms need to focus on three areas: raising the wage floor, valuing women's work and skills, and extending employment opportunities. And under raising the wage floor, they say research shows that the less the overall inequality in wages, the lower the penalties for being at the bottom of the wage hierarchy. As women are overrepresented and, e and even concentrated in the lowest paying or lowest status jobs, it is particularly important for the minimum floor to wages to set a decent standard in relation both to living cost and to median wages. International definitions consider low pay, low pay to be below 60 to 66 per, percent of median pay, but medium but minimum wage levels are usually below those ratios. I mean, again, folks, women just don't make less money than men do because, oh, well, that's just the way it is, and women don't work. Is it's no, no. Women actually work probably more hours than men do, and there's more women at the lowest paying jobs. The, the wage well, floor has to come up. Yes, it's got to come up. Right, exactly across the Your board, Brian. Across, across the board. board, yeah. And Brian, we haven't, you know, dissected these numbers in terms of women of color. Because oh, that's man. a whole nother level, even below, you know, that's that floor ceiling, if you will, you know, at the bottom. And then mm -hmm. we haven't even factored in the additional, when I say burden, I don't mean like what I'm getting ready to say, like, but child care, there's an additional tax, there's an additional cost that probably isn't, I don't know if it's factored in or not, but the time and the energy and the money that's afforded for childcare, then Absolutely. lessens the earning power of those lower wages. So it's a compounding effect. And like I said, when you factor in women of color and those differentials, um, you know, you can see why the disparities continue to exist and continue to um, widen instead of con con uh, con contracting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, this to, to that point, in terms of improving the, the valuation of women's work, one of the things that I saw in other countries that is not happening here, that is a specific um, um, direction around the value of women's work has always been things like uh, paid maternal leave, right? Where mm -hmm. you're mitigating, you're trying to mitigate that extra tax that women have for not only childbearing, but child rearing within those yeah. first critical first years of a child's life. And I know yeah. in Europe for specifically, um, I think in the EU, there has been laws that are now on the books which pay women for two years of maternal care and rearing. Two years, two years salary. And then it also guarantees that they're able to return to the workplace when they're ready. There's also paternal care, but that's a whole nother thing, right? Where, right. where if the man is there with the woman, there's less of a tax on both of them as a family, mm -hmm. right? But what you what they have seen is women do what they need to do. They 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 become new mothers or or, or renewed mothers, um, and they return to the workplace, and 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 that they that that there's a feeling of being valued there. Um, they said men in, in, in the UN uh, women's brief. They say minimum wages will not solve all problems, and there's a danger that they may become. The on that they may become the ongoing rate of wages with differences in skill and experience going unrewarded. Only 43% of countries with data have laws that require 
hang on, let's see. Uh, that laws that require equal pay for work of equal value. And even then, equal pay legislation mainly applies to within company comparisons. In context of occupational segregation, there needs to be more scope within equal pay law for comparing pay across organizations and sectors. I mean, this is not rocket science, y'all. This isn't <laughs> rocket science. Right. So you know what you know, came to yeah, my go mind, ahead, Brian, ahead. is uh, when you said two years, some countries have maternity leave for two years. I believe at least I'm not as in touch because I'm out of that in terms of being an entrepreneur right now. But I believe, isn't it just still 12 weeks here in the U.S.? Yes. I mean, and some of that, you have to exhaust your sick time. You have to exhaust your vacation time. Um, I don't want to misspeak, but I, you know, remotely remember my own experience and I just opted out. I opted out for six years right. um, and it wasn't easy, but, um, you know, there are the differences you know, again, put that extra tax on the women. And then you may or may not have the same type of position when you return, if you decide to wait too long to return. Right. So I know that's a whole nother, um, whole nother show, but as you can see, there are um, differences. And like you, you said, it, it also starts with having more women in those leadership positions, more women Absolutely. in the boardroom, making those executive contributions to policy and procedures that might trickle down to, you know, all levels so that we can increase the, um, you know, the outcomes in this disparity whole issue. Absolutely. You know, uh, yes. And it is, it, and this was, and I just looked it up up until 2020, this was just four years ago, there was no paid maternity leave with federal employees, y'all, federal employees, there was none of that. 2020 was the first year that there was 12 weeks of maternity leave. So you got four months to have the baby and get the baby started and get them into childcare. Just think about that for all of you who are parents, how difficult that whole transition is and continues to be. Right. And, and that's for and not only families that, right. That's for families that can afford it. Right. That's what I was going to say. I mean, if you, you know, let's say for, if, if you happen to be a single parent, for example, I mean, just think about the compounding effect and then, you know, there's not, we haven't even mentioned the recovery time for the woman oh, postpartum, you know, postpartum depression, any physical um, or health conditions that still persist, you know, there's a, it's a big deal having a, a baby and, Absolutely. um, you know, of course there's a cost to the employer, but, um, you know, if you just look across our our different countries, we are not treated in an equitable way as far as, um, you know, FLMA and 12 weeks of, uh, okay. Um, want to get to this last recommendation from UN Women, and that is improving access to employment and advancement, which is so, so true. So the third set of policies is to promote better access for women to employment opportunities. This may have the effect of reducing gender-based occupational segregation. Desegregation of occupations, however, is not in itself an automatic route to solving the gender pay gap, since the overall pay in the occupation may fall, or women may become concentrated in lower ranks, in lower ranks within, within the occupation. Furthermore, many of the jobs in which women are concentrated, such as nursing and child and elder care, are extremely valuable to the society. Moving women out of out of care jobs, for example, does not solve the problem of who is to provide the care. What is needed 
is action to improve the wages attached to these jobs, amen, so that those providing paid care do not face financial penalties. It says to open up employment opportunities requires a two-pronged strategy. The first is to create more opportunities for progression within occupations or workplaces where women predominate. Uh, the trying to look at the second here. A second approach is to support women pursuing flexible or nonlinear careers. Ooh, yeah, the most direct way to do this is to provide for maternity and paternal leave preferably paid with the right to return to the same or similar job at the end of the leave. Yes. Again, this is yes. not rocket science. Well, I think the, the point is, is that, you know, professions like nursing, like teaching, like social work, um, those are you know, what we call those caring, nurturing type of positions. And women are overly concentrated in those occupations, which then, you know, reduces the, the ceiling, right? And I, I wrote down, even with the WNBA, there's a, a caretaker of legacy, like, like they are in the position of being the caretaker of the legacy of the WNBA which is why maybe some of them have an affinity to stay within the league versus necessarily going overseas where they might make more money. So that nurturing, caring essence of that make up who women are, a lot of women who a lot of women are, factors into this whole occupational over-concentration of women in certain occupations. And that doesn't get at, like you said, it's very valued. We need it in, you know, to make our economy work, but then not compensating accordingly is, it's just not ethical. It's not, it's not right, but yet we can't do without, right? We can't do without our teachers. We can't do without our nurses. We can't do without our social workers, for example. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I can't help but think that in the midst of all this, um, you know, we, we, we you know, uh, the reporter that was on ABC News was talking about the fact that this is capitalism and, you know, this kind of thing. Yes, I get that part. I, I get the, the, the capitalistic part that I believe is unjust. It is immoral. It needs to change. But I also can't help but think that there is a political end to this as well. Because mm. women, if, if you write the ship around economics with women, you can't help but also write the ship around policies and that kind of thing, because women will have more money to support the political candidates that support their interest. I mean, specifically a lot of single mothers, young, young professionals, young entrepreneurs, right? That are all women. And so it would just be, it would be really, really interesting to see what would happen. And I would love to live in a world where that happens where um, women are treated more equitably. Um, man, such a good conversation today, Chanel. Um, kind of want to end this it's with- So important. With, yeah, right. I want to end this with a quote from Lily Ledbetter, who has fought for uh, pay equality for a long time. And she says, your worth is not determined by the size of your paycheck but by the determination and resilience you show in the face of injustice. So this is up to all of us. This isn't just on women to talk about this. This is about all of us to talk about because this is injustice in it just at its heart that, that women aren't being paid what, what they need to be paid, need to be paid, not want, need to be paid. So. Need. Thank you for being here, Chanel. Um, 
I just want to end too that, you know, the work that you do with women is so important, uh, specifically giving them support. And you are, you're continuing your beautiful gift of doing complimentary coaching sessions, specifically with women. Men, if you want to call, you can call too. But this, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a women's saying right here we're talking about. Um, tell us a little bit about these while we have time. Sure. Well, Brian, some of the women that I work with are seeking advancement in their careers. And I have been able to help women negotiate their new salaries. And it's surprising to me what women will leave on the table simply because they don't ask. Really specifically, I've been able to help women negotiate executive coaching into their new contracts, which six months later, then they come and hire me. And that's not mm -hmm. self-serving. It's you will need executive coaching as you go up the ladder. I've been able to negotiate, help them negotiate getting paid for their um, forthcoming degrees. One woman was wow. getting ready to get a, a doctorate within, let's say, four or five months of being hired. Well, at that wow. time of, of the degree, she then will get a salary bump. That has to be negotiated at the beginning before you sign on the dotted line. So these empowerment sessions are really the start to get you on the path to empowerment, to even pay equity to the extent that we can within our system. So please give us a call. Give me a call. I'm happy to chat with you and get you on the right direction. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. That's so true. Women do leave stuff on the table, mainly because they don't know. They just don't know. And we so as, you know, as, as, as my parents would say, when you know better, you do better. So um, I hope everybody understands what we talked about today and that they go out now that they know better, they can go out and support women in getting their right, just due. Um, thank you, Dr. Chanel, for being here once again. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Um, Listen, we're going to take we're we're actually out of time, but before we get out of here, just want to say thanks to all of you for being here on Solivity today. Uh, this is how we do it Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern and 8 a.m. Pacific out on the West Coast with KMET 1490 AM radio. Until next time, keep working that passion and purpose, and you're going to create that best life today. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.